Hi, girls. How you doing? You doing good? You want some gold? Look what I brought with me. The best toy ever. It's a box, right? It's the best toy ever. Can we um, puddle around my box? Come here, sit down. Can you mind sitting down? All right, so this box came in the mail a couple weeks ago, and I love this box. Look at this box. Is this the coolest box ever? You're kind of nonplussed about the box. You don't really care about the box. Okay, that's because you haven't thought about what this box is. What, 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 can we engage our imaginations, all the things this box could be? I mean, number one, it's easy. Um, here, we're going to write it on here. Number one, it's a box. Okay, so I'm going to write box. It is a box, all right? But what else could the box be besides a box? It could be a table. Like, if we're sitting around, we could just, like, put dinner out here. So I'm going to write table. It could also be a table. Very good, Gabby. All right, what else could it be? It could be a baby bed. It could be a baby bed. Like, if we flip it this way and put blankets in it, is that what you mean? Yeah. It could be a baby bed. Now, that's good one. I hadn't thought about that one. A baby bed. What else could it be? It could be, okay, now I need help with that one. How on earth, you've got a good imagination, how could this be a rocket? Oh, you could draw like, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, see, I'm now, now I'm getting it. Now, is that kind of look like a rocket? Oh, you could make it with the box. Oh, and this could be like the cockpit. You could like get in the box and be the, like the astronaut in the box, right? And we could tip the box back and go, right? Oh, that makes me think of something else. This could be like a little car. I mean, like a little sports car. You guys could be the motor. You could push me all over the sanctuary. That'd be great. I See, I like that. This is good. <laughs> what are you guys doing for the next 20 minutes? We're going to play a uh, sports car. I like this. You great girls are going to, oh, and something else it could be. I got to get out of the rocket sports car. Listen, listen. Help me. Oh, this is a great drum. And if we really want to irritate people, we'll just put it up like this and bang the sound at them. Wouldn't that be great? This is a great drum. Oh, you guys have great imaginations. You know what? When it came in the mail, I was thinking, oh, this thing is so cool. This box has so many possibilities. And it's not very hard for me to take the imagination of what a box could be and realize that's kind of how God thinks about us. Um, what are you? You're a kid. You're a girl. Um, you're going into fourth grade, right? All those things are true about you, and you say, yeah, I'm just a kid. If this box could talk, the box might say, I'm just a box. But somebody else can look at a box and say, are you kidding? This is a table. This is a baby bed. This is a rocket. This is a sports car. This is, oh, I got an idea. This is a great hide-and-go-seek hiding place, right? Like if you were down on the floor and the box were on top of you, nobody would know you were there unless you, you like, moved, and then the box would move, and then it would freak us out. We'd think it were a home for a ghost or something. See, if the box could talk and we said, box, you are so special, the box might go, I'm just a box. But we can look at it and say, oh, no, it's so much more than that. And that's kind of how God looks at us. We look at ourselves, you would say, I'm a kid, I'm a girl, I'm going into fourth grade. You know, I say, I'm a guy, I'm a man, I'm a dad, I'm a grandpa, that's all I am. And God looks at us and he goes, are you kidding? Man, with a little imagination, look what I can do with you. And that's what God wants to do with us. He looks at us and he goes, oh, I see so much more in you than you might see in yourself. So if you ever have those thoughts, I'm just a me, no. Ask God what he sees you as. And think about this box, because this is a rocket. This is a drum. This is a baby bed. This is, this is so cool, and you guys are cool, too, in God's eyes. Can I pray with you? Hey, warm your hands by the picture of the fire. Okay, now let's have a campfire prayer. God, I thank you for these girls, and that when you look at them, you don't just see girls, humans, kids. You see so many things that they are. Will you help them to believe what you know about them and help them to become what you know they are? Thank you, Jesus, for these kids and for what they teach us every week. We pray in your name. Amen. Thanks, girls.
I, th I think I may have hit another level of being a grandpa a couple of weeks ago. Here's how it goes. So I walked in the door, and my son Vinny, he's home for the summer, and, and he was putting together this. It's an outdoor fireplace thing, a, a gift that we got for my father-in-law for his birthday, and really cool outdoor fireplace thing, really cool one. And I walked in, and he's got parts all over the place. He's good at putting stuff together, so he's putting it together, and it's almost together. And I looked at it, and I went, that is so cool. And he goes, yeah. And I said, um, can I have it? And he goes, Dad... This is, this is for, the, no, this is a birthday present for somebody else. I said, I'm not talking about the outdoor fireplace. I'm talking about the box. And he goes, what do you want the box for? I said, Charlie, can you imagine what a 15-month-old can do with this box? And so I said, well, I, I, it's kind of not my call if you have the box from the fireplace thing, but whatever. And so I took it and I put it behind the couch. Well, Charlie came over and spent the, the night one, one night this week, and I pulled out the box, right? And I have all these ideas of what the box could be. I mean, I'm, I'm just picturing um, Charlie in the box. Picture a 15-month-old little boy in the box driving the semi. I'm making the noise around the living room, right? So I pull out the box, and I said, Charlie, look what I have. And he came over. Well, I've put the lid inside, the box inside the lid right now, but it was all together like this as a box. And I start to pull off the lid, and I'm like this. I said, Charlie, help Grandpa pull the lid off. Charlie comes over, and he starts pounding on the box. I'm like, oh, okay, Charlie, that's making it really hard to, to get... He thinks it's a drum, not a semi, right? So I said, okay, okay, we'll put it on the ground. Well, then I get it on the ground. You know what this looks like to a kid that's 15 months old? about a 12-inch stage, and he starts climbing up on the box. Now he's got a place to stand and make Grandpa nervous that he's going to fall off. I'm like, Charlie, there's a lot of potential in this box if you just let me show you what it could be. But you know what? The eyes of a 15-month-old, he saw so much more than I saw. I saw a semi-truck. I saw a place to hide when you're playing peekaboo and hide-and-go-seek. He saw a drum. He saw a stage. He saw so many things he can do with this box that I didn't see. And, and I was like, like, this is a cool moment. So this is now the new toy in our living room. It didn't take me very long. Um, I have my, my morning devotions in the living room, too, and the box is there right behind the love seat. And as I was um, reading along in my devotions one morning, it didn't take me long to see that box and make a spiritual connection to it. And I went, you know what? I think I do that same kind of thing with Jesus. Um, I have this boxed-up understanding of who Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is a member of, of the Trinity. Um, Jesus is my Savior. Jesus came to earth, and he was God with us. He was Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus went to the cross to die for my sins, and Jesus went to the grave. And I've got all, those, all that belief in my little Jesus box. And it was like Jesus was saying to me, okay, you got everything boxed up that you know about me, and you keep it very neatly in this box, and, and that makes sense. I mean, all those things that I just said are true about Jesus and important truths about Jesus, but maybe it's safe to keep Jesus in my little belief box. Maybe it's comfortable to keep Jesus in my little belief box. And, and it hit me as I was doing my devotions and thinking about this box over there on the other side of the living room. I wonder what is true about Jesus that I don't have in my box yet. Now, I, I know some of my thinking has been, um, has been impacted in the last few months by this book, Love Does. I'm just going to do a little survey. I, you'd think I would get royalties for all the advertising I do of this book. How many of you now in the congregation have read Love Does? Can I say, oh my goodness, that is fantastic. Am I right? Is it a life-changing book? It's incredible. Next time I ask that in August, let's have like three-quarters of the hands go up. This is an amazing book. One of the things I like about Bob Goff's writing is um, he's a little bit like me in that he says at the beginning of every single chapter, um, I used to believe that this is true. Now I know something else is true. Let me give you a sample of that. Um, chapter 8. I, I used to think being a believer was enough, but now I know Jesus wants us to participate no matter what condition we're in. That's a huge truth. I, I really like that one in chapter 8. Um, at the beginning of, of chapter 9, he says this, I used to think you had to be special for God to use you, but now I know you simply need to say yes. 
That's a huge truth. You've got to read this book, it's a life-changing book. But this whole concept of, I used to believe that Jesus fit into my belief box. What's not in my belief box about Jesus that needs to be there? And so I set a goal for myself this summer. Um, by the end of summer, I, I want to know Jesus better. I want to know the real Jesus better and expand what's true about Jesus as revealed in Scripture. And I want to understand Jesus a lot more. And so I set out on this quest. How am I going to get to know Jesus? I'm going to go to the Gospels. That's you know, the story of Jesus. So if you, if you take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 5, first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 5, it is the life story of Jesus according to this guy, Matthew, who was an eyewitness of Jesus' life, and he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You get to chapter 5 of Matthew, and, and you get this very familiar territory. Let me just read a few verses in Matthew 5, right at the beginning of the, the chapter. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside, and he sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those that mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And it keeps going on for another five verses. It's going to be the blessed are the, for they will be statements. You know what those are called, right? If you don't know, it might be labeled in your Bible, right? Those are the Beatitudes. And, and the Beatitudes are the, the anticipatory set, the, the introduction that Jesus is making to one of the most famous sermons of all time, a sermon called the... Sermon on the Mount, right, exactly right. This is the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is going to go into the Sermon on the Mount, and so much of what we have in what I'm calling our Jesus box, so much of what we know about Jesus' teaching comes from Jesus' teaching on, in the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's things like this. Um, Jesus is going to go through this series of statements. Now, you've heard it said, do not murder. Uh, I'm going to make that a little bit stronger. If you are even angry with your brother, you've murdered him in your heart. Whoa, Jesus, wow. Well, that's one of the Jesus statements in the Sermon on the Mount, very familiar statements. Um, Jesus is going to talk about divorce. Jesus is going to talk about loving your enemies, not just loving people that love you. Jesus is going to talk about, um, he's going to say these three statements in a row, when you give, and then he'll give instructions, when you fast, when you pray, and, and so he assumes we're doing all these things. All these things that are a part of our understanding of Jesus comes from Sermon on the Mount. Um, Jesus is going to say, why do you guys put so much emphasis on what clothes you wear? Um, haven't you seen the good work that my father did with the flowers of the field? He kind of did okay with flowers, and flowers are just flowers. Don't you think he cares a lot more about you? And then that famous verse, middle of the Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. That's all Sermon on the Mount. So much of what we have in our Jesus box, our basic understanding of Jesus, comes from the Sermon on the Mount. But remember what I told you my goal for the summer is. I want to find out things about Jesus that aren't already in my box. Because I got my boxed understanding of Jesus, and Jesus is a lot bigger than my box. I want to keep going and learn more about Jesus, so I kept reading. Um, Sermon on the Mount goes for three chapters. Aren't you glad we're not going to cover the whole Sermon on the Mount this morning? No comment needed. We get to chapter 8, and, and the Sermon on the Mount is now done, and it's just right after the Sermon on the Mount that we get this, the, the next little narrative, and it's this tiny little four-verse narrative about what happened next in the life of Jesus. And if you're like me, and you already have it all boxed up, you know everything you need to know about Jesus is all in your box, you're going to read the next four verses really quickly. But if you're like me this summer and you want to see the parts of Jesus you've never considered before, you want a fresh understanding, you want more things to go into your understanding of Jesus, then you have to read those verses over and over and over and say, what do I know about Jesus from this narrative? Look at chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. When he came down from the mountainside, end of the Sermon on the Mount. When he came down from the mountainside, large, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourselves to the priests 
and offer, offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. If you just already have it all boxed up and you know everything you ever wanted to know about Jesus, then you can forget this narrative. But if you want more to go into the box, little details about Jesus to go into the box, you need to read that and read that and read that. And, and since I did that this week, I just, I would just want to share with you some of the, the things that are going into my Jesus box from those four verses. First thing is this. In the middle of a multitude, in the middle of a crowd, Jesus notices the individual with a need. I think that's really interesting. Picture it accurately, right? So Jesus is doing the Sermon on the Mount, a sermon where he sits down to teach a bunch of people. Then the sermon is over, fairly long sermon, and he walks off the mountainside, and the crowds follow him. He's moving, and the crowds follow him. He's surrounded by a crowd, and Jesus, in the middle of that crowd, he notices the one guy with the need because the guy talks to him. Um, it's not uncommon at this point in Jesus' life for him to be followed by a crowd. If you'll keep your finger in Matthew chapter 8 and go back three or four pages to Matthew chapter 4, I just want to show you the end of Matthew 4, verse 23, all right? This will show you, this is just so typical of Jesus right now. Matthew 4, 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, the epileptics, and the paralytics, and he healed them large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis and Jerusalem, Judea, and the regions across the Jordan followed him. All right, so this is just normal for Jesus. If you're trying to picture this, it is not uncommon at all for Jesus to be walking across a meadow or down a hill or around the corner, and he's got this crowd of people, and they're bringing needy people to him. This is just normal. But in the middle of that, Jesus notices in the middle of a crowd, Jesus notices the one person with a very critical need. I don't know what your leprosy is. I don't know what your critical need for Jesus is. But I want you to know something. One of the things that's going in my Jesus box is this. There are like, I don't know, four or five dozen people here today. That's a lot of people. I have no idea what your needs are. But Jesus knows what your individual needs are. Jesus can look at a crowd, and he can zero in on the one person with the critical need. That's something that's going in my Jesus box. Jesus notices one person in the middle of a crowd. But he doesn't stop just by noticing that there's a guy there. Notice in chapter 8 that Jesus takes time to meet the need of that individual. He doesn't just notice that there's a need. He takes time to meet the need of that individual. Verse 2, notice what it says. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said. You don't even need to read what the guy said. If you're picturing it, Jesus is walking. He's walking away from the crowd, and they're following him. He's moving. He's walking. They're following him. If he's not going anywhere, if he's just standing there, nobody's following him. They're just standing with him. He's moving. Picture it. And this guy comes around, and he kneels in front of him, which means Jesus stopped. Jesus took time for the man in the middle of the multitude that had a need. I think that's significant, maybe because I, I picture everything in, what do I do? Um, I, in the last 48 hours, I've gotten two texts from people saying, hey, can you look at your schedule this coming week? Could we do breakfast on Tuesday just to get together to chat? Um, hey, would you have time on Wednesday to meet a group of guys I called the boys at the high school? Could you meet the boys for coffee this Wednesday? And my answer is the same every single time. Hey, I'm not at home right now, but when I get home, I'll check my schedule and I'll see if I have time. That's how I respond to people stopping me, asking me if I can meet their need. But Jesus is so different. Jesus just stops. You think Jesus doesn't have a schedule busier than mine? Oh, my goodness. Jesus just preached the sermon of his life, and he's going on, and he's about ready to heal blind people and paralyzed people and deaf people and leprosy people. He's about ready to resurrect people from the dead. He's got it all scheduled out. But this one needs to go into our Jesus box. In the middle of a need, Jesus stops. 
and he reaches out and he meets a need. I don't know what your leprosy is. I don't know what your need is right now, but I do have news for you. Into our Jesus box needs to go this truth. Jesus just doesn't notice the need in a group of people. He stops and he meets the need. Oh, here's a third discovery that I had in this. Not only is Jesus noticing needs and meeting needs, but Jesus is not shocked by or repulsed by how messy the need is. Verse 3 is a really revealing verse. Um, Verse 2, the guy says to him, Jesus, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Verse 3, Jesus reached out his hand and he touched him. And I want you to do something, a little, little group involvement here. I want you to picture that the, the person in front of you or the pew in front of you is this man with leprosy and you are Jesus. And, and, and the person in front of you or the pew in front of you just stopped and he stopped you and he says to you, you're Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. On the count of three, do what Jesus did. All right, look at verse three. All right, now on the count of three, do what Jesus did. One, two, three. He reaches out and he touches a man. He reaches out and he touches a man. You say, big deal, Greg, what's the big deal? Are you kidding me, what's the big deal? This man has a skin disease. Leprosy here is, it's a funny word. It's hard to translate. It doesn't really mean leprosy, like leprosy, like put him in a leper colony. No, it could mean any skin disease at all. This could be poison ivy. This could be a boil on your arm. This is something undiagnosed. And if you want to spend some time doing it, I wish we had the time to do it. Um, Go read Leviticus chapter 13 and 14. Two chapters in the law are dedicated to what happens if you get a little rash on your arm. You have to go to the priest and you have to show him your arm, your leg, your belly, whatever. And he's going to look at it. He's not even gloving up and touching you, right? The priest wouldn't do that. He would look at you and instantly put you into seven days of quarantine. Then you're going to come back in seven days. He's going to inspect again, and he's going to see if it's gotten worse. He's going to examine what color the hair is in the middle of that ooh spot that you have on your body, and he's going to send you into seven more days of quarantine. And then if it's healed, if it's not getting worse, then he's going to send you through this whole process of cleansing, and look what Jesus does. Jesus doesn't say, hey, buddy, you're kind of messy. You kind of got that disease. You get away from me. You just seven days from now, you come back and let me reexamine. No. Jesus reaches out and he touches the man. It does not matter to Jesus how messy the situation is, how infectious your mess is. One thing that's got to go into my Jesus box is this. Jesus doesn't care how bad the mess is. A bigger mess just says you need a savior worse. I don't know what your leprosy is. I don't know how bad the mess is for you. I know how bad the mess has been for me. And Jesus says, I don't, I don't mind getting my hands dirty. I reach out and I touch the mess. Oh, it doesn't stop there. Oh, it doesn't stop there. Look at this. Jesus values, this is the last observation I'm going to make. Jesus values the process of redemption because Jesus sees so much bigger story than we see. Picture it accurately. Jesus reaches out and touches this man, and instantaneously, the man is healed from his leprosy. That boil that he had, it disappears. That poison ivy, it goes away. His, his, I mean, it's gone. This guy is clean. Notice what Jesus says to him in verse 4. See to it that you don't tell anyone. But go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. I need to do a little explaining from um, Leviticus chapter 13. All right, so here's what what happens in the Old Testament according to the law if you end up with some kind of a skin problem. You go to the priest and you show him yourself. And in chapter 13, Leviticus 13, you'll find out the priest is going to quarantine you for seven days and say, away from the community, come back in seven days. He'll re-examine. If it hasn't gotten worse, that means you're, you're heading toward recovery. He'll quarantine you for seven more days. And if you're clean at, at that point, then he's going to send you into chapter 14, where you're going to go into this whole ceremonial washing thing. First thing you're going to do is you're going to take a bath. A bath, you're going to get rid of your clothes, get new clothes, take a total bath, and get a razor out and shave every bit of hair on your body, including your eyebrows. It's all coming off. We're going to clean you up completely. Then you're going to go get two birds 
and they're gonna, you're going to take him to the priest, and you're going to take one of the birds, and he's going to kill it, and take the blood of that bird, and he's going to sprinkle it on you, and then you're going to have to bring, let's see, what is it, um, two male lambs and one female lamb. And, and he's going to go through this process of slaughtering those. This is a long process if you're messed up. And at the end of it, he's, the priest is going to declare that you are clean. Notice what Jesus says to this guy in verse 4. He says, don't tell anybody that I just healed you instantaneously. I want you to go to the priest and go through the process. Why on earth do I have to go through the process, Jesus? You healed me. I'm clean. My leprosy is gone. Why do I have to go through the process? Oh, my goodness. Put this in your Jesus box. See to it, verse 4, that you don't tell anybody. Go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded you. That's the two doves and the two lambs and the female lamb as a testimony to them. Why do you have to go through the process of redemption? You're already clean. You're already forgiven. God cleaned up your mess. Why do you have to go through the process? Because other people need to believe that you went through the process and you're redeemed by Jesus. It's a testimony to them. And they have inspected you. And you used to be the guy that had a messed up life. And you went to Jesus and he cleaned you up. And man, I inspected you twice. I killed a bird for you. I sprinkled blood on you. You are really clean. It's not coming back as a testimony to them. Listen to me. One of the new things in my box about Jesus is this. God rarely wastes a redemptive story. So you got a mess in your life, or you had a mess in your life, and Jesus intervened in your situation, and he cleaned up your mess, and he forgave you, and he made you the stellar person that you are now, God's not going to waste the messy story. Because you're going to encounter somebody that says to you, you know, you, look, you go to church every Sunday, you don't know what it's like to be me, and you're going to say, oh, are you kidding me? Can I tell you my story? Can I tell you how messy my life was? Can I tell you the leprosy of my soul? Can I tell you that I had to stop Jesus and he took the time for me and he said to me, I am willing and able to make you clean and he touched me and he changed me? That's what God did in my life and he can do it in your life too. Jesus values the redemptive process not because the process saves you or cleans you, But the process will save and clean other people that will relate to your redemption story. Yeah, I got a lot in my Jesus box. It's the normal stuff. He's my Savior. He's God incarnate. He's part of the Trinity. He went to the cross for my sins. He came back from the dead. Kind of the Apostles' Creed. It's all in my box. But Jesus is saying, yeah, there are some other things that need to go in your box. I notice you in the middle of a crowd. I notice you got a mess going on. I am willing to touch that mess, even though it's messy. And I want you to go through the process because I'm going to use your mess and my redemption in your mess to talk to other people about their mess. I'm going to keep reading um, the book of Matthew. I actually have about 16 sermons now that I have things that are going in my box. Come back next week. Maybe we'll hit another one. May God add his blessing to the reading and explanation of his word.